to folks standing around, in and around our lines at polling places being intimidating. Folks working those lines, telling people if you have outstanding rents, if you have um, uh, a warrant against you, if you have the whole list of things, you can't vote, right? All of that I expect to come back like 30 years ago. So what do we do? So what we're doing is building this voter protection machine. We're going to need volunteers everywhere to help us police this, right? We're going to need people at these polling places who can report to us, to our attorneys, that this is happening so that we can call actual law enforcement, not whoever that is standing there with a weapon, but actual law enforcement, and get them taken away. But we can't do it if we don't have an army of folks exactly. working these polling places to be able to report this work that's happening. They're going to try it. They're going to be they're going to be challenging voters inside the polling places, saying, "I challenge you based on whatever." They will make it up, but they're going to be challenging voters. And our folks inside those polling places will be trained to push back on those challenges to make sure folks get through the process without being stopped. <coughs> I have to tell you, if somebody standing there challenged me, and I didn't know better. Sure, I'd be like, "Oh, I guess I can't vote," right? Which is why it's so important that our folks are in those rooms saying, "Nope, that's not true." I had a story, heard a story the other day of someone who was coming in to register, first day, first time registering, same day registration now, and the volunteer there said, he said, I can't register here, I'm registered wherever mom and dad are. She said, yes, you can register here. Someone behind the table said, no, you've got to have a consent from your parents to do that. Mm -hmm. oh. That's not a thing. That's not a thing. Right? So then, you know, the voter protection volunteers like, no, that's not true, son. You can actually. So we need folks in those precincts. So we've got an aggressive team that's being put together. We're going to need lots of volunteers to do this sort of work in these polling places to make sure that we're protecting the vote. Um, we're going to do a it's not a dry run. I'm calling it a dry run, but it's a real election. But we're going to do this work on the primary day to sort of get the kinks out of the process and make sure we can communicate up the chain of all of that so that we're not just doing it for the first time in November. We're going to be doing it in March. So we're going to be doing that. Please do. Our team is still going to find out right now. Here in the chamber. Yes. What, uh, how does the tournament or uh, the legal status for carrying a weapon at a polling place? That's a good question. Yeah. Right. So I don't I don't know, you know? I think that your the school, the one school not allowed to open very Right. So that the polling has a school and it depends on where the polling polling place is located. So if it's in the government office one, you can't open areas for the government. to the suppression, but we're also working on uh, making voting uh, more accessible from that standpoint. So we've been working with the county clerk here uh, to try and get um, absentee ballot drop boxes oh, in places yes. where, you know, what we noticed when we were knocking doors in Muskegon Heights where there were like old or disabled folks who hadn't send out their ballots because they didn't have the stamps. Right. So we would keep a roll of stamps in our back pockets just to you know, tell them, mm -hmm. put them out for the postman. But what we're trying to do now is just get, you know, because the city clerks do have the discretion to have, you know, drop boxes if they want. Just so you know, and I wanted to say that here, because anybody who's um, working with their uh, city clerks, whether it's township or anyone, we're getting a little bit of pushback from the city clerks. They perceive this will be more work for them, mm -hmm. you know, and there's all these other 
issues, you know, that, you know, when you present something new, people initially, so we're doing it soft, but we do want to get it done before the primary, and we do have even funding for the, um, for these drop boxes. So if anyone here who has access or is in dialogue with their city township clerks, please, you know, if you can recommend that it would probably be a good idea. We had designated some places like elderly towers, handicapped places, places where people have mobility mm -hmm. issues. And uh, on top of that, we're also going through a transportation change in the city where they're uh, talking about eliminating some corridors um, where low-income people are. For instance, we have a, a Peck, on Peck Street, we have two of the Muskegon Heights polling places, and they want to eliminate you know, half of that, that, that route there. So on many really? levels, yeah, on many levels, we're trying to keep them from suppressing the vote, but we're also trying to make voting easier. So we're working that hard and heavy, but you know, the clock is ticking, and if anyone talks with their city clerks or the tower, wherever you are, you know, be vocal about, you know, sure would be nice to have an absentee ballot box somewhere, you know, so that they know it's not just us out there pushing them. That's so. a great idea. I think the ballot boxes are so smart because that's so much easier than A, having to figure out how to stamp and mail. Right. And you don't have to wait for the office to be open. If you can drop it when the office is closed, you can drop it. That's the, right. That's right. Smart. So we're, that's, that's a work in progress. Sort of a vague memory reading through the absentee ballot that if you call the city clerk, they have to come and pick yes. it up. So oh, yeah. you want to double check that. That's good information. But that, that's why I brought it up because I think they are they are obligated to come and pick it up if you call them. Well, that's persuasive right there. You know, if they have a, a different place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Today I talked to our township clerk and she said about absentee ballots that once you make your first application then you put on a list for any following um, yeah. elections with the application. Yeah. That's so that's, that's right. You have to check your box on this application. You have to ask. Because that is not consistent. Right? No, it does good clerks to do that sort of work. And you recognize that if you've done it once, you're likely to want to do it again. And other clerks will do it. Why don't refuse to do that? Even the same home, they do that in your town, yeah. but they don't do that in all the cities. Right. 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 Okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, my, my clerk just sent an application to me, one to me, one to my husband, but not to my kids. Or one to me, one to my husband. Not about age, by the way. But it was only the president. It's, right? It wasn't the official form that I see on the Secretary of State, but the two boxes. It was one just for the presidential primary. And I'm like, well, thanks for sending it, but what if you said something that allowed me to choose to get my ballot to go? But it's just, you know, so I thought that was so very inconsistent across across cities and countries about how it's done. Yes. Yes. My clerk also put the stamp on, by the way, I know that I'm having to read it, but put the stamp on my ballot envelope, return envelope. Right, but it doesn't happen everywhere, so it's just a ourselves feel like, well, you said we have brains. Right. So we ourselves feel like we cannot be manipulated. We 
and I'm telling you that we can yeah. as well. So I, I want to know from, from that side, how do we take care of that and get that information out and tell you, you need to know, you need to see it, when you see it, you can identify it. So I have seen, and Chris, you'll make a note so I can find it, I have seen from the DNC a, 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 a short, I don't want to say the full page, description of like what to look for and what to watch for. But one of the things that they say, which I, I, I try to do, but I'm, I'm guilty of as well, is it's the source, right? It's like who, like where did that story come from? Not the source meaning your friend who shared it, but the source of that story. And take a moment to do a little research about what that is. Now the other thing the Republicans have done, is, and the Russians, is build these sources that look yes. so very real. Nope. It's not yeah. just the ones that look like a that's fake right. MSNBC page, because that's out there too. I don't know if you've seen it, that's out there too. But these that look like actual news organizations. And you'll go to them, and they'll look like they have real stories, and they will mix in some real stories to make it look real. So it's hard. But the other thing the DNC is working on is identifying these and giving them to us so that we know. But they keep popping up new ones, so it's almost impossible to keep track of all of the fake news sources that pop up. Um, it's, it's tough. It's a full-time job, frankly, maybe we should think about a full-time job, um, of, of keeping track of all of these. And I've, I've learned recently that there are several now Michigan-specific fake news sites that are delivering Michigan-specific fake news designed to impact our vote. They're out there already. So here, and here, and here. Um, if you're interested in um, the uh, Lake, the chair of the Lake County Dems, Mary, thanks, has actually de developed a method to sort out Russian emails, groups, and that kind of thing. She actually spoke at the FBI last year. She's already found about 800. Yeah. Yeah. She has a this year. Talent. So she has a yeah. great talent for that. So if you're interested, you can get a hold of her and she may be able to come and do a you know yeah. just a simple training session. Yeah. Um, but she's actually gotten responses back. She'll actually tell catch this Russian and she'll go, uh, by the way, just so you know you have about thirty <laughs> seconds before you're gonna be kicked off. Right. And the Russian will send her back, thank you, but you know I'll have to open another two hundred and fifty to make up for the money I'm gonna lose by losing you. Mm -hmm. um, so, just to let you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can contact her and she'd be happy to uh, send you. She actually, like I said, she went to the FBI. She got so good at the FBI, had her come out and train some of their technicians last year. Um, so, if you, know, if, you're, if you need that contact information, you has got it. I've got it. You got the information? I got it. I have a question, though. Um,